This episode is brought to you by the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook, the first beautifully designed, fully customizable paper charting workbook designed with you in mind. With three years worth of charting pages, the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook has you covered. If you've been looking for a solid alternative to charting apps, you'll love this charting workbook. The Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Workbook is available in both Fahrenheit and Celsius editions, and it's available in spiral bound, paperback, and ebook versions. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash workbook to order your copy today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash workbook. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 347. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. I'm excited to share today's episode with you. In today's episode, I am sharing my interview with Mark McAfee. And for those of you who don't know, he is a raw milk producer in the United States, the biggest that I'm aware of. And so if you're fairly new to the podcast, milk and the concept of unpasteurized milk has come up on several different occasions. And if you want to look back into some of the archives, I'll link my previous episodes with Sally Fallon Morrell of the Weston A. Price Foundation. And I'm sure the topic of milk has come up potentially in some of the episodes about period pain. But just for those of you who this is a very new topic and it's kind of like, well, why would this be? discussed here. I think that pretty much all of us are familiar with the idea that many people have issues with dairy. (laughs) There are many, many people who can't tolerate dairy and who stop consuming dairy products because of negative effects, some digestive issues and things like that. And so many people identify as lactose intolerant. But it turns out that there's more to this milk story. So I talk about this extensively in the fifth vital sign and I always joke to my clients like, I know a little bit too much about milk. But there's several reasons why milk can be an issue for people. So one of them is the protein in the milk. And so if you've ever wondered why, you know, there's children who can't have regular cow's milk, but they can tolerate goats or sheep milk, or even, you know, women with period issues who switch to goats or sheep milk and then see an improvement, that can be related to the protein in the milk because different cows and different animals produce different proteins in the milk that react differently. And many people react very negatively to the A1 protein that is found in most of our conventional milk products. So that's one issue. Some people react negatively to the processing. And so there are people who react differently to the warped proteins that are, you know, changed and denatured during the pasteurization process. And so there are people who actually find that if their milk is closer to the source, that they can tolerate it better. But that dives us into the controversy because there are many places where unpasteurized milk is illegal. And there are places in Europe where you can get milk out of a vending machine. (laughs) So uh, we get into the controversy and I'm thrilled to just be jumping right into it and talking about this interesting, very interesting, but also controversial topic on the, the show today. So without further ado, let's jump into my interview with Mark McAfee. Let's welcome Mark McAfee to the show. He is the founder and CEO of Organic Pastures Dairy Company, a leading California and national brand of truly raw dairy producers, including milk, butter, cream, kefir, and truly raw cheddar cheeses. 
He is the founder and chairman of Raw Milk Institute and is an internationally recognized speaker and expert with an emphasis on raw milk production standards, gut biome, milk genomics, nutritional benefits, food safety, and the medical benefits of raw, unprocessed milk and milk products. Mark is deeply involved with raw milk safety research and is associated with the International Milk Genomics Consortium at UC Davis. Since 2018, two peer-reviewed research papers have now identify the Raw Milk Institute standards, training, and testing protocols using the raw MI effect. Since 2014, in the USA, there has been a 350% increase in raw milk consumption with a decrease of 74% for reported illness associated with raw milk. This positive effect has been associated with the advances in testing, technology, and the standards and training developed by Raw MI and its PhD board of directors. Thousands of farmers have received the Raw MI, R-A-W-M-I training on how to produce raw milk for human consumption versus standards for pasteurization. I introduced him already ahead of time, but I'm really excited for this interview because this would be the first episode solely dedicated to the topic of raw milk. I've had Sally Fallon Morell on the show a couple of times and we've certainly touched on it, but today we're just going to dive in head first. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Mark. I am very, very pleased to be with you. And Lisa, I've been in Canada many times. It's a favorite place to go. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a pretty lovely country. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, well, you know, before we jump into the, the topic of the day, I mean, I think I'm curious and everyone's curious, most likely, how did this become kind of the center of what you do? So maybe share a little bit about what you do and, and how, how and why raw milk became the center of it. Well, my first chapter in life, I was a paramedic. I was a medical educator for the health department. I ran 16,000 plus or minus EMS calls, and I really met humanity uh, in all of its uh, interesting variations. I delivered 26 babies, uh, God knows how many gunshot wounds and car wrecks and plane crashes and everything else, heart attacks, diabetics. You call 911, you got me for 16 years. Let's put it that way. So I really got very exposed to the human experience in all of its shades. My grandparents passed away in the late 1990s and left a thousand acres of prime agricultural ground to my brothers and I, and none of my brothers wanted to farm. And I, I wanted to leave EMS. It was exhausting, 24-hour shifts, and, and the whole emotional thing is pretty exhausting and intense. My wife's also in medicine with her master's in nursing, so labor and delivery. With that said, I kind of approached farming. I grew up on the farm. I approached farming from a different perspective. I wanted to be organic. I wanted to be consumer-connected I wanted to be whole food oriented. So I did my research by going to farmer's markets in Los Angeles and talking to mothers and fathers who would come to the farmer's market table and say, you know, are you a farmer? And, and had that dialogue between the consumer and the farmer, the farm to consumer connection. And I asked them, I said, what kind of food would you like? Well, we'd like to have raw milk, safe, no GMOs, no antibiotics. Uh, we'd like to visit you. We'd like to have our cows on pastures. We'd like to have immune supporting food. We'd like to have all the transparency you can have with unprocessed whole food. And with that dialogue, I came back to the farm and developed Organic Pastures Dairy, which is now the largest raw milk brand in the world. We're milking about 800 cows on our 500 acres of pasture here. We're milking twice a day. All the milk comes to our on-farm creamery, where we make butter, cream, cheese, milk, and kefir and deliver in our own trucks, deliver to the stores and farmers markets throughout the state of California, about 450 stores, and then 1,200 stores for our raw cheese nationally. So uh, it's been consumer driven, and I mean that with all the intent of a loaded statement, that it's consumer driven, it's not processor driven, it's not policy from the government, the CDC or FDA driven, it is consumer driven. And that was my original intention when I started was to be consumer driven, be consumer connected and be responsible to the consumers, paid by the consumers, have them tour the farm, have a relationship directly with consumers. And that is a very, very, very wonderful relationship to have because you get paid well, you know, you're no longer in the dairy crisis anymore. You're getting paid much more than you would if you're going to sell to a processor and you have a whole food. And the stories that come back from consumers, whether they be younger children, older people, uh, middle people, people trying to get pregnant, uh, all kinds of walks of life come to you and say, tell, share their story with you. 
I'm also involved with the International Milk Genomics Consortium, which is an affiliation of consortium of PhD researchers around the world that do research and study on breast milk and raw milk and all the elements found at the genomic level, the proteolytics, the proteonomics of all the different things going on at the genomic level, at the very, very microscopic level in milk and why it's such an incredibly powerful food. And I like to just start by saying breast milk is raw milk. And when you think about raw milk, think about breast milk, think about the first food of life, the first food of life. A baby is born naked and wet, just came through the uh, birth canal. What's the first thing? Put the baby on breast. The breast pr produces colostrum for the first few hours and days. And that colostrum transfers immune system from mother to baby. And then raw milk comes pouring out of the lacteal glands and creates the gut biome that did not exist before birth. So the gut biome is the seat of 70 to 80% of the immune system. Uh, at least that many cells lie in the intestinal lining. The microbiome is the seat of the immune system. It protects us. It digests our food, creates enzymes. It is the seat of our immune system. It protects us from getting sick. A new research uh, uh, study just came out of China. It's talked about the fact that if you have coronavirus, please breastfeed your children. Don't stop breastfeeding your children because breast milk and the raw whey protein and other elements, there's all kinds of elements found in breast milk, actually suppress 100% of the replication of coronavirus cells, and that's in breast milk. And they said that mammals' milk actually does 70 to 80% of the same thing because it's in raw form and has the raw whey protein and all these living, totally functional, alive proteins and enzymes and bacteria and all these things put there by nature intentionally. You won't find that in, in baby formulas. You won't find that in processed milks. You won't find that in any of the foods. This is the first food of life engineered by a million years of evolutionary pressures, selective pressures, generation by generation to have the best food, to give that baby the best shot at being healthy and survive at the weakest time in life. So raw milk is a powerful food. And the more they research it, the more they realize how powerful it is in terms of having a good gut microbiome and the fact that your immune system is very powerfully supported by eating whole unprocessed milk and other foods as well. So that's kind of a purview of how I got to where I am today. And I'm extremely excited because my next, my son and my daughter have actually kind of taken over the business so I can do things like I'm doing with you this, this morning, Lisa, because they are running the show. And I do a lot more educational outreach with the Raw Milk Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit organization. And, and that's a very important thing that I do, and that is training farmers to do raw milk well. In other words, there's two kinds of standards for raw milk. Raw milk intended for pasteurization, which doesn't really matter what you do with it because it's all going to get cooked. It's going to get barbecued with heat so that there's no living bacteria and everything's denatured. But raw milk intended for human consumption has completely different standards, and you produce it differently. And I do that training uh, internationally in Great Britain, in Canada. I've been up there many times training in Canada, all across the United States and down in Australia as well. And some work in, uh, in Argentina. So it's an international scope. So that's kind of a little bit about me and why I'm so passionate and excited about what we do. Well, thank you for that. There's a lot of questions I want to jump into. Considering that, you know, I don't know what percentage of my audience is really well versed in this concept of, of raw milk. So there are plenty of listeners who are familiar Perhaps they're familiar with the Weston A. Price Foundation and they they understand where this all fits in. But there's plenty of listeners who are kind of like, what do you mean? <laughs> are you talking about unpasteurized milk, the kind that kills you, right? So let's jump into some of those kind of the difference between the mainstream understanding of uh, the pasteurization process and uh, why anyone would want to consume milk that has not been pasteurized. You started to talk a little bit about the difference between commercial milk production and how that has to be pasteurized. I, I think I used a quote in the fifth vital sign. I had a little section on milk when in there and it's kind of, it was like a, I felt that it was really important to distinguish between commercial milk and raw dairy, but right. on the different levels, like from the level of pasteurization to homogenization, uh, homogenization to the level of the cow's, eating grass versus being fed con conventional feet, like all the different levels right. to, to try to make a case for milk. Cause there's even a lot of people that will say you don't even like human beings shouldn't even be consuming milk. So that's like a huge load of stuff, but I'm just going to pass that over to you. <laughs> a, a couple of things. Let me quote Dr. Um, 
Bruce German, who's probably the foremost leading milk uh, genomics leader, researcher in the world from UC Davis. He said, pasteurization is a answer to an 18th century problem and we can do much better. So, you know, it's interesting that in the 1800s, yes, there was a lot of people that died and children that died from consumption of filthy raw milk when cows are being taken into the cities, out of the country environment, into the cities where there was no uh, fresh water, there was no chlorine, there was no stainless steel, typhoid fever was rampant, tuberculosis was rampant, it was disgusting, there was no rapid chilling, there was no way to really convert commercially uh, produce raw milk in a way that would be sanitary uh, like it was back on the farm with the right kind of environment, with clean water and, 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 and green grass and sunshine. You take a cow into the Boston Commons and you cover it with manure and dirt. And the only thing that's available to feed that cow is the byproducts of some brewery, uh, distiller's grains. And you had a very unhealthy set of conditions. And in 1893, Strauss brought in a, the parboiler, which is a pasteurization technology out of France, and uh, it was basically used in the beer and wine industry to get rid of bacteria so the yeast would grow. And you brought it in and you started cooking the milk and a lot fewer people died. They still had problems because of water quality. But that became kind of a commercial exploitation device and system to allow for trashy, ugly milk production. And that continues through today. Raw milk was very popular through the, the, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s as a certified milk. The American Association of Medical Milk Commissions, which is an international organization which had very high standards, physicians supervised milk, and the milk was recommended by doctors because it made for strong, healthy babies. And it was very expensive. It wasn't the cheap milk that could be just processed. So yeah, raw milk had it, it was thriving for 60 or 70 years after the 1880s and 90s, but it became less and less important because after, two, uh, after World War II, it was all about the industrial solution. It was about how we could bomb people to comply. It was about how we would spray things to kill things. It was about DDT being good for your skin and smoking being good for your lungs. I mean, it was all about making money and commercial and industrial solutions and less of a partnership with nature. And now we understand that raw milk's been consumed for 12, 15,000 years. And it always gave those ancient civilizations a competitive advantage because they had a whole food that supported their immune system and they thrived because they could take their, mo their food with them. The Romans took cattle with them all the time when they were uh, going around run around the world. Uh, you know, it was about having a, uh, an animal that could eat grass and, and sunshine and water wherever you were and you had food today, cheese, buttercream, milk, and beef. If you had to get really hungry, you could eat, eat the cow itself or goat or sheep or camel. So it's a long history of consumption of raw milk that recent populations of people have forgotten because for the last 75 or 80 years, milk has been pasteurized for the most part. And when you pasteurize milk, it's interesting that if you go to the FDA website, do a little Google search there, and you see what's the most allergenic food in America. Don't recommend or suggest what it is, just ask the question. Number one is pasteurized milk or milk as they call it because all milk in their mind is pasteurized. So when you pasteurize milk, you make a very allergenic food because the bacteria are killed, the enzymes are denatured, the proteins are denatured, everything is kind of destroyed. Your body doesn't recognize it as a friend. In fact, it's very allergenic and you create mucus and you have all kinds of reactions like asthma and mast cells degrade and histamines are released and all kinds of issues. Cytokines go around telling all the wrong chemical messages. So you created a reality in people's minds where the only last three or four generations has all been pasteurized milk. There's no recent memory of the great grandparents that would told you how fantastic raw milk was when it came from the family cow. So we have this recency problem where everybody says, oh, milk that I get from the store is really not good for me because I, I get gas, I have digestive problems, and it's very allergenic. So why would I drink that? I drink my almond milk or soy milk or some other thing or no milk at all. But those that have discovered that clean, fresh, delicious raw milk is fantastic for your immune system and cuts through all that BS and gets to the real science of the history of milk and doing it properly are thriving and doing great. So it's a, it's a big educational challenge to cut through the bias that the FDA, CDC, and big processors have because processors hate raw milk. They wanna get it cheap 
and they want to get all the milk into their processing plant to make products to make money for them. They don't want a farmer to go from farm to consumer and cut them out. So raw milk is a a political nightmare for them. It's an economic nightmare for processors. And the FDA stands with the processors, not with the farmers. So in California, raw milk is legal. In New York, it's legal. You can't buy it in the stores, but you can buy it on the farm. Uh, There's about 20 states where you can buy it in some fashion on the farm or in a store. And then other states, you have to have a cow share or something else. In Canada, you can find raw milk, but you have to know somebody. It's kind of a speakeasy, uh, moonshine running kind of a deal. But those that want raw milk can Sorry, find because, it. Because it's illegal in Canada. I just had to it, put that in there. So in Canada, you can smoke all the pot because that's legal, but the milk is illegal. That's correct. And raw milk is illegal because of one, one thing. And it's a good and bad thing. The dairy industry has really got their act together to protect themselves in Canada. They have a supply management program, which will not allow anyone to produce milk outside of their system. And they've not allowed raw milk to be part of the system. And I've been up to Canada many times, and there's a huge amount of effort in Canada to try to allow uh, a cottage or niche industry addition to their milk supply program. In Canada, pasteurized milk does very, very well because they don't allow overproduction, and they control the price to make sure the farmers do well. And they do very, very well. But what the farmers fail to realize is consumers have a hard time digesting and having issues with allergies with pasteurized milk. They would do so much better if they recognize that they should allow raw milk to be part of their system and control it as well in terms of oversupply. So Canada's got a real problem that they're disconnected from their consumers, not listening to the end consumers very well. And if they are, they're ignoring them. So I would encourage the dairymen to realize there's a huge opportunity to truly fully nourish your society by having clean, fresh, delicious, tested raw milk, which is fantastic. So I was part of a documentary, like a short uh, yep. documentary that was done. I forget the name of the channel, but one of the kind of local channels, probably more like Toronto. Right. And basically, I mean, it was interesting. I, I was interviewed for like two hours, she had all this footage and they took out everything I basically said. And when I watched the documentary, like basically they were saying that raw milk is dangerous yep. because... It's because it's it, unless it's pasteurized, it is necessarily dangerous. And the spin that they put on it was that anybody who fed it to their children or drank it themselves was basically playing Russian roulette with their lives. So it was very, very heavy handed in the negative yep. portrayal of it. So, you know, in case people don't know <laughs> who are listening to the show, I'm a consumer of raw dairy and our family has been for the past five years. So we go to a farm and we get our, our milk, we get it right from the cows and it is not pasteurized right. and we are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and we have had no issues. I suppose there's a couple questions that I, I kind of want to pose to you. I mean, I'd love to hear you address this, this concept that it's so dangerous. One of my, and one of my observations, because until I had access to raw milk, I had never even seen it. You know, I didn't grow up on a farm <laughs> and I, I didn't necessarily spend a lot of time on, on farms either. Right. But a few of my observations as a consumer is that it's not the same substance. When you actually start interacting with raw dairy, you realize that pasteurized commercial kind of ultra processed dairy is a glorified white liquid. And one example that I'm sure you'll appreciate is that if you leave your raw milk on the counter for a couple of days, it'll clabber and turn into curds and whey. So now I know what that is. It's, it's not just like little Miss Muffet because now you can actually see. So the curds are the solids and the whey is the liquid. And if you were to put that in a cheesecloth and hang it to, to drain out the solids, you get cream cheese. Right. We all know what happens if we leave out pasteurized dairy. It goes putrid and it stinks up everything and you have to kind of clean it with major cleaners. So that's just one example of the difference, but I'd love to hear just your take on this concept because in Canada, that idea is very much the line and that is the line of health Canada. And that is what they say is the reason why they won't allow it. 10 years ago, there was a poll taken of the Canadian dairymen. 80% of them drank their own raw milk. That is a fierce, a fear uh, program a fear political device used to try to keep consumers 
from thinking about raw milk and keeping them to consuming pasteurized milk and to suppress the raw milk movement. There is absolutely no legitimate background for that at all in recent modern history. In fact, the Raw Milk Institute is proud to say that if you go to rawmilkinstitute.org, there are two peer-reviewed articles that were uh, published in the last two years, uh, one by uh, Joanne Whitehead and the other one by Dr. Katherine Berg, that show that the Raw Milk Institute effect, they gave us actually a lot of credit for training in the last 10 years uh, for establishing standards where raw milk has literally had no outbreaks, no illnesses. And there was a British Columbia uh, herd share program that did a bunch of research up there where they had a, a bunch of dairies that were, were micro dairies that were producing raw milk and the herd share, herd share program that tested their milk, hundreds of samples of milk, no pathogens found, no illness involved. Remember that when you pasteurize milk, you don't care about pathogens. All the salmonella, listeria, Campylobacter and E. coli you want can go in the milk because they don't care because it's all going to get cooked, right? So why wouldn't you use the fear factor that, oh my God, if you go to any dairy, you're going to get this bad milk with all these pathogens. That's true if you just throw the manure in there and who cares? So there's two different standards for raw milk. Raw milk intended for pasteurization, raw milk intended for people. And when you apply the proper standards and you clean the udders properly, and you, and you have healthy cows, you don't see pathogens. Or if you do, it's extremely rare. And this was shown in two peer-reviewed published uh, articles that are now available at PubMed. So the information is there. It's just that very, it's, it's an inconvenient truth to acknowledge that it's there because it erodes your marketplace. Wherever you see raw milk being sold, the people will buy it at three times the price of the pasteurized milk because it's so good for them. It's delicious and it's a different food. So it's a political ploy. It's a bias. It's a tool used by those that don't want to see competition to try to suppress the excitement about raw milk. Uh, the studies, the science is completely juxtaposed. It completely shows that it's not a true statement at all. Now, if you go back to the 1800s and you had one kind of raw milk, and it was all filthy and ugly and whatever, that's true. If you go to pasteurized milk, you look at the milk milk tank on some of the dairies out there that uh, don't have very scrupulous systems and their programs are set up for pasteurization, true. You go to my dairy, you go to dairies that are listed by the raw milk institute, you go to those dairies that uh, comply with the local standards for raw milk, which are very intensive, not true at all. So they're ignoring the standards intended for human consumption and saying, oh, just use the old standards for pasteurization. It's completely a false paradigm. You have to separate the two. There's two kinds of raw milk and two kinds of practices. It's not all the same. That's the big thing. That's the big hurdle they have to get over. And it's very convenient not to get over that if you have an agenda and a paycheck, which depends on protecting pasteurized milk. Let me think of how to ask this question. Or, <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, I could start by saying that I did read the book, The Raw Truth About Milk by William Campbell Douglas. Uh, yep. He's a doctor. And yep. he talked about something he called raw certified milk. And yep. in that book, it helped me to understand, because like I said, I'm not a farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm. So the idea that you get from the media about milk is that it is inherently full of pathogens, that it right. comes out of the cow just teeming with salmonella and E. coli, and you're just going to die. That's but what true. I learned <laughs> from not reading the all. book yep. is that when you are intending, as you said, to produce raw milk for human consumption, there's a few steps. So even before you milk the cows, you want to make sure that you're feeding them a certain way. You want to make sure that you're taking care of them so they're healthy. And, you know, the whole point of getting raw milk is not to have hormone laden bacteria, you know, antibacterial laden products. So you're talking about healthy cows eating their traditional kind of, you know, regular grass diet, but also something that I learned. And I think that he described cows as being like filthy, dirty animals <laughs> that always right. are kind of like in their own, there's manure, they're sitting in it, all that kind of stuff. So he talked about this process of cleaning the udders and making it so that when you're milking, it's pristine. And he talked, I think the part that clicked for me to help me understand was that he, he talked about, you know, when milk is contaminated. Now, this is what he's saying. So I, I want to hear, because you're the farmer, <laughs> but he was saying that the milk is contaminated 
after. So you milk it and then it, it, it's then contaminated between it coming out of the cow and it getting to you. That is correct. Milk from a healthy cow has very low levels of, of beneficial bacteria, very low levels. Most of the bacteria that's in milk is actually in the handling after the milk is actually out of the cow. So a healthy cow actually produces this is a, a standard plate count of maybe 300 or 200 and a coliform level of like less than one and no pathogens at all. Can you explain what that means, the level of 300? Because just so the, that we know what, you're, what you mean. The total number of bacteria, living bacteria in one milliliter of milk, one milliliter of milk, maybe two to 300 at the highest as low as 50 sometimes. So it's in a range because a lot of it's in the resident bacteria in the teat canal itself or the surface of the teat, not generally inside of the udder. There's, there's not a lot of bacteria inside of the udder of a cow unless she has severe mastitis or inflammation of some kind. And that's true for all mammals. That's true for human females. So it's a very low bacteria food, but the kind of food that's inside the milk the lactose sugar, the oligosaccharides support the growth of bacteria so that it thrives in the gut. So it's good prebiotics for the probiotics that are there. So whatever bacteria is there are supported in growth to actually grow when it arrives at its destination, which is the human gut or whatever mammal baby is drinking it. So it is not a true statement to say that milk coming out of a healthy cow is teeming with pathogenic bacteria at all. I will say that the kinds of management systems that manage milk after milking, the milk claw, the milk filter, the milk lines, the chillers, the, the tanks, can be teeming with path pathogens if they're not managed properly. And there's biofilms that are actually on the surfaces. Those biofilms can be rampant in a pasteurized environment because, or milk intended for pasteurization, because you don't worry about the bacteria because it's going to get killed off and it costs money to keep those things clean. You have to use cleaning chemicals. You have to keep them clean. You have to be conscientious and studious with taking care of your equipment. So there's two kinds of standards for raw milk, raw milk for pasteurization, raw milk for human consumption, and they're entirely different. And the risk programs to manage those are entirely different as well. And you're paid differently for them. And you have different customers. The customers that consume it are are consuming families, right? Versus a processing plant where that milk is commingled with everybody else's milk. And it's all processed by pasteurization two or three times, not just once, and homogenization, supplementation, all kinds of other things that happen. So all that pasteurization thing is really good for shelf life, but not good for gut life. And our gut is not a shelf. It is a place that requires living whole foods. And, you know, on point for your discussions today about fertility, both mom and dad need a whole food diet, a Mediterranean type diet, lots of fiber, lots of bioavailable nutrients. It needs a strong immune system, less inflammation. All those things are brought to you by raw dairy products, powerfully so, along with a whole food diet. And it doesn't have GMOs or Roundup or antibiotics or that other funky hormones and stuff. Just a whole food, good from good soils, unprocessed diet is what a, a Mediterranean diet is, including raw cheeses and raw milk. And those diets support fertility. They decrease inflammation. They encourage the correct, proper hormone production to allow you to produce the correct, you know, ovums, the make sure your eggs are, are walking around right and make sure that sperms are doing their thing. They swim fast enough and they've got the right genetics and that they, they actually get together and they implant properly and they carry the baby to full, uh, full term. And that the mother actually has the right pH in her vaginal tract so that when the baby is born, the right inoculum is on the skin so that they get ingested into the mouth and into the gut to create the right bifidobacteria area in the gut the right raw milk being produced, nutrition for the mom. I mean, all this stuff. And then the next step levels for the baby to correctly create an immune system for life comes from raw milk, from the mother first, and then from other ca uh, for cows or goats or sheep or camels around the world uh, in the life process. So that's the way mother nature created it to be properly. Mankind has screwed it up so badly we can't even recognize the immune system anymore. And we have a real problem with understanding what real food is. And when we don't eat real food and we eat a lot of sugar, 
preservatives, antibiotics, we have an immune system destruction. Our hormones are a mess. And we have a problem with fertility, sperm count dropping like a rock. Young ladies can't get pregnant. It's a disaster. And it's Mother Nature saying you're going the wrong way, turn around and go back or turn around and go some other direction. It's Mother, Ways, uh, uh, Mother Nature's way of saying, you got it all wrong. We don't want that to continue. So we're not going to give you babies. We need you to do it properly so that you'll have babies and those babies won't have Asperger syndrome and ADHD and have all kinds of problems with celiac and have to get colostomies and diabetes and asthma. And you just go on down the line uh, with chronic inflammation and colds and flus and, you know, it's, it's ugly. Mankind before the advent of, of modern medicine, yes, we had a higher mortality rate from various different things, but we had a much stronger immune system to protect us so that we could thrive in spite of having all these pressures from nature. We have modern medicine now, which is a miracle and also a detriment because we are taught to do whatever we want, go to the doctor when you get sick, instead of prevent disease so you don't need to go to the doctor and only go there on a rare event that you need something extra special. So we have to shift our resources into prevention through nutrition, which means go to the doctor. I mean, not go to the doctor, but go to the farmer. So it's the farmer you see, not the pharmacy. It's just a complete different shift up. And there's a lot of money that says don't do that because so much money is made in the pharmacy and the in doctors and that medical paradigm wants to continue to feed itself. And farmers need to say, wait a minute, look at all these wonderful studies coming out of Europe. Look at these studies that show that when you have a strong gut microbiome from whole food nutrition, that's unprocessed whole natural foods, you prevent disease. You decrease inflammation. You have a good functioning gut microbiome and you're very healthy. And raw milk is literally the king of that whole, that whole diet in terms of assuring a good, strong microbiome. I wanted to pop in with a quick message from today's sponsor, Audible. Did you know that you can listen to The Fifth Vital Sign for free when you sign up for a 30-day trial with Audible? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash audible for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. Now let's jump back into today's episode. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the things that came to mind as you were talking is uh, kind of what works versus what doesn't. Right. And so I think for a lot of women, a lot of families, you can, you know, do whatever you do. And then when you start having children and maybe your children have certain issues, like whether it's allergies or different food sensitivities, you, you really, I think it, this stage of life prompts a lot of women, a lot of families to then look at, you know, what works. So if you're, and, and the trend that you touched on of, so even I remember when I was in my early twenties, so I can't really have a lot of regular highly processed milk. So in my early twenties, I kind of identified as being lactose intolerant. I never had a test, but I knew that when I drank milk, it sent me to the bathroom. And yep. so I finally had enough early twenties. And then I decided, okay, so I'm just going to drink soy milk. That didn't work out so well for me because soy is estrogenic. And so it had obvious effects on my menstrual cycle. I was charting every time I would drink the soy milk, yep. my cycles would get really long. So then, you know, I switched in coconut milk and almond milk and all these different and it's so interesting, right, that they can use that word, call it milk, because it's not the same. But basically what we're seeing is this, you know, a lot of people are finding that it just doesn't work. Right. And instead of understanding deeper that it's not the concept of milk as a category that's the problem, but more of the pasteurization. And I would, I would say the, the ultra processing of it, any ultra processed product by definition is going to have less nutritional value and obviously a lot of the questionable issues. So a lot of parents then find themselves turning to goat and sheep milk if the issue is related to, and I'm not sure if you want to talk about the difference between the A2 and the A1 protein, but also a lot of families, even if they switch to the goats or sheep milk, or even if they switch to organic, still pasteurized, maybe not homogenized milk, they may still find this is an N of one, so it's not scientific, but what I found early on with my, my eldest son was, you know, we went for organic milk, we went for sheep's milk, we did all of the things, but he would have this kind of runny nose and he had this like kind of just drip for like a year. Yep. Yep. And then when we stopped, when we actually found raw dairy 
and we started incorporating it, that went away. Now, again, this is just an end of one. This is just my experience. I'm not saying that this is everybody's experience, but what I, the point I'm making is that as a parent, you, and as a person, you just do what works. (laughs) Well, let me add to that. Let's change that N of one to N of 55,000. How's that? When you do the N of 55,000, the European studies kick in. There's major studies showing a, a huge numbers of children that are evaluated that consume raw milk. And the one big factor in their life that's, that's common is consumption of raw milk. It's not where they live or how they live. It's raw milk. Shows allergies being reduced dramatically, less asthma, less ear infections, less colds, less eczema. All those things are that N of 55,000. So it's not just you and your family. And I would expand that to say multiracial, whether you're Asian, you're black or you're white, universally raw milk could be consumed by everyone, including American Indians who never drank historically raw milk because raw milk has in itself its own inoculum of beneficial bacteria, which when it reaches the gut, those lactobacilli bacteria and other beneficial bacteria create the lactase enzymes for you in your gut. So they actually welcome the lactose sugar when it comes in. And what do you know? The lactase is available and you digest the lactose sugar. No problem. When you have pasteurized milk, you don't get that benefit. So it's we call it pasteurization intolerance, not raw milk intolerance. And I've got many Asian and black friends have said, I can't drink that processed stuff, but I thrive on yours. And the bottom line is, it's a processing problem. And many white people have the same problem as well. Because once you've been introduced to a lot of antibiotics in your life and preservatives in your life, you lose those beneficial bacteria, you're going to have lactose intolerance as well. So most all babies don't have any problems with lactose intolerance because they nurse their mother's milk. And mother's milk has plenty of lactose, but it also has those incredible 700 different kinds of bacteria in the milk, the breast milk, breast milk from the areola. It's not a clean process. It's actually very much a microbiome friendly living whole food with all these diversity of bacteria. To quote Dr. Annette Jewett, who is a foremost uh, cancer researcher at UCLA. She's a PhD researcher at UCLA and at Los Angeles. She said, three things are needed to control inflammation in the body. And inflammation is the major source of infection and disease, including infertility and all kinds of problems, inflammation, chronic inflammation. You need a diversity of beneficial bacteria, you know, high load of them, and you need the whole food that feeds them. Three things, beneficial diversity of bacteria, a load of them, lots of them, and the good food, the whole unprocessed foods that feed them. Those three things will drop inflammation like a rock. And we don't do that in America. We don't eat whole foods. We eat a lot of preservatives and sugars and all kinds of funky stuff, which disrupts the, the, bec- the bacteria growth. We don't have a diversity of bacteria because everything's sterilized and, and nuked by pasteurization. And we don't get a load of bacteria because everything is actually a long shelf life product, which doesn't have a lot of bacteria. It's got sugar in it or preservatives or GMOs or Roundup or something else. So the triple whammy, the trifecta is really affecting us greatly right now, including coronavirus. Let me tell you what the raw whey proteins and all these other things found in breast milk actually control coronavirus very effectively. There's a recent Chinese study that'd be more than happy to share with you that showed that mothers that breastfed their children, even then when they were coronavirus positive themselves, protected their own young from the fact that the raw whey protein was actually suppressing the growth of, of coronavirus in their babies. So the World Health Organization strongly encourages breastfeeding babies when the mother's even positive coronavirus. And they found that 70% of that same effect occurred from mammals milk, goats, camels, sheep, horses, and also cows, or cows were referenced. So there are innate things found in raw milk, breast milk, and the European studies that end of 55, I was talking about, 55,000 I was talking about, that show the decrease of viral infection in children, the flu, the viruses, and colds by drinking raw milk. So it's very much a current issue here that we really, you know, vaccine would be nice, but I tell you what, a nutritional solution to the gut microbiome would even be better to prevent ourselves from all kinds of things. And breastfeeding and raw milk are right there, right in the core of it. Well, whenever you mention breastfeeding, I mean, there's so much interesting research about the, you know, how beneficial human breast milk is for babies. And uh, there's some research showing that not only does mother's milk provide healthy bacteria to help seed the baby's gut, it also provides food for the bacteria living in the baby's gut. So your breast milk is actually feeding your baby's bacteria and breast milk changes throughout the day. It changes 
based on the age of your child. So obviously you produce colostrum at the beginning, which you mentioned, but you know, the breast milk that you produce for your baby at two weeks and four weeks or eight weeks is different to the breast milk at three months and nine months. So your body knows and adjusts accordingly. So if you really do study the science of milk, <laughs> uh, the real stuff, it's really fascinating because it, as you said, it is a, a living food, a lot different to kind of our understanding of milk. Uh, I, and I find, I find one of the most powerful things about breast milk that I, I just, it makes hair stand up the back of my neck. And that is the oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharide sugars are very specialized sugars. They were just discovered uh, what they were, what service they, they were, what purpose they were serving in breast milk just a few years ago by Dr. Bruce German, that investigator at UC Davis. And that was the oligosaccharides do not feed the baby. They feed the bacteria in the baby's gut, selectively suppressing pathogenic bacteria and enhancing bifidobacteria. Wow. So you have a food the baby is getting from mom, the oligosaccharide sugars, specialized sugars, which suppress bad bacteria and encourage good bacteria in the gut of a baby and changing the gut pH and all that stuff, the bifidobacteria. Um, incredibly powerful directives from mom through the breast to the baby in terms of building the immune system. So you're absolutely right. Breastfeeding, breastfeed as long as you can. And one of the things we've discovered is if you have a shortage of breast milk and you're not be able to produce enough for your baby, the baby's hungry and you can't get enough, drink more raw milk yourself and you actually get more raw milk out of your breasts. My daughter did this and we've had literally hundreds of, if not thousands of people in California that had a challenge getting enough breast milk. And we say raw milk in, raw milk out because it encourages the hormones, the bacteria, everything going on, all the elements you need to produce for your own breast milk are coming through from the raw milk you're consuming and the, the, you'll get engorgement in 24 hours. It's pretty powerful stuff. Well, and I mean, one of the questions I wanted to ask you because so for the listener who, for, for whom this is all relatively new information, right? Uh, and even having, listening to a conversation with two people talking about unpasteurized <laughs> dairy raw milk as being like a, a healthy food and um, a beneficial food for a lot of folks listening, this may be the first time they've heard a conversation like this. So one of the challenges I would say in, because not everywhere obviously in the world is it legal uh, or is it regulated? This is one of the challenges with kind of criminalizing or, or not making raw milk accessible to the consumer, even though there's always a demand everywhere you go, is that then you don't necessarily have a standardization process. One of the big parts of our conversation today was the discussion of how the pr process of creating milk for raw milk for human consumption is different. And so one of the obviously hugely important aspects of what you've done is to create and then now teach a standardization process for farmers to be able to produce what we could call certified raw milk. And so, you know, I'll kind of bring this into a question, but basically if you could share with us a, a little bit about that process, but also help the person who's listening because, you know, we can talk about the benefits all day, but if you're going to an individual farmer, there it's natural to be a little bit nervous. Sure. especially because of all the years of like, this is bad for you. Uh, you mentioned drinking raw milk when you're breastfeeding. And so a lot of women would kind of be like, whoa, 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 right? I spent my whole life being scared of anything that wasn't pasteurized. Recommendations for pregnant women say, stay away from anything that is not pasteurized. So making that shift, how can we, what questions would we ask if, if one was seeking raw milk, how I'm kind of like going on, but there's one other thing I wanted to say. When I talk about raw milk with people, they often think it's just like this rogue back door kind of thing. And when I talk to them about how milk can be tested for bacterial counts, like you said, we're not in the 1800s anymore. Like we can apply modern science to raw milk so that we can be safe with it. Yeah. So I, I just, I'd love to hear you expand on that. Well, uh, first of all, there's a European study that actually show that, that, that mothers that drink raw milk during pregnancy have a different cord blood in the babies when they're, bo when they're born. The cord blood actually has very high indicators for immunoglobulins, which are antibodies, to protect the babies from allergies for life and asthma for life. So drinking good, safe raw milk from a trusted farmer during pregnancy is a powerful gift to the baby and gives the baby more building blocks in terms of the immune system. That's number one. Number two, you have to understand the standards. 
Let me just quickly describe the standards for pasteurization under the pasteurized milk ordinance. And they're about the same around the world. They're a little different here and there, but for the most part, they're about the same. Number one, you never test for pathogens. Bad bugs are never tested and you can have as many as you want in raw milk intended for pasteurization. So there's no discussion about pathogens because it's gonna get under a five log kill. It's gonna come under heat or some other process. It's mostly heat right now. They're using high pressure processing, but most, for the most part it's heat, 160, 180, 280 degrees temperature, depending on the pasteurization process to kill bacteria. You can have up to 750 to 1 million coliforms per milliliter, which is an indicator of sanitation. You can have 50 to 100,000 standard plate count per milliliter. This is raw milk for pasteurization. So 100,000 bacteria per milliliter, 750 to 1 million, or excuse me, 1,000, 750 to 1,000 coliforms per milliliter, and all the pathogens you want. That's standards for pasteurization. Now, standards for human consumption for raw milk, less than 10 coliforms instead of 750 to 1,000, so extremely clean, and your standard plate counts in the hundreds, maximum maybe 5,000. Pasteurization, after you pasteurize milk, you're allowed to have up to 10 coliforms that are alive, and you're allowed to have 15,000 standard plate counts. So it's even cleaner than post-pasteurized, but nothing's dead. So that just tells you how filthy things are going into the pasteurizer. It's just a dramatic difference when you don't commingle your milk with other farms. The milk goes directly from your cow into your bottle and chilled immediately. And then we do testing to assure that there's no pathogens. At Organic Pastures Dairy, which is the company that I own and founded, we test every day with Bax PCR RT, the PCR. And that uh, PCR test actually indicates within just a few hours if pathogens are present. So uh, it's interesting that you can actually apply the proper technology now to actually indicate before the milk even leaves the farm that in fact, pathogen, your milk is pathogen free. The common standards, and I use common standards in quotes, are posted and published at the Raw Milk Institute and have been used now internationally to define, describe the actual standards for raw milk for human consumption. And it talks about all the processes you go to achieve the less than 10 coliforms, the less than 5,000 standard plate count and pathogen free milk so that milk can be fresh and clean and safe for consumers regardless of their status, whether they're immune depressed, pregnant or whatever. So the common standards are available, they're published and they're used by farmers all over the world. Not every farmer uses them, but many do when they produce raw milk for human consumption. And the technologies now, like you mentioned, are now able to be applied on the farm and in labs near the farm to actually ascertain the safety of milk. So it's no longer a question. We know exactly what's in the milk before it's even consumed. So the idea that raw milk is innately unsafe is absolutely untrue, not true at all. In fact, it's a lie. It's an intentional distraction to try to get people to be convinced that, in fact, it's gonna, one drop is going to kill you. Uh, it's not true at all by your own life experience and by the life experience of hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people in California that consume our products from 450 stores that thrive on it and have for 22 years. And before that, the American Association of Medical Milk Commissions, the certified raw milk, thrived as well for the pre preceding 60 years with Altadena and other producers from the 40s and 50s and 60s coming forward until we took over with the grade A standards with the common standards. So... We really have a mind, a brainwashing we have to get away from to understand that sterilized foods are not good for you. They are not good for your immune system. We are bacterio sapiens, the Human Genome Project, funded by the FDA and the NIH and the Department of Energy, showed that literally 95% or more of the genomics, the genetics in our body that make us human come from bacteria in and on our body, not from mom and dad. This is human genomic 101. And this is only 20 year old information, but yet it conflicts so desperately, so dramatically with the antibiotic concept to sterilize everything, kill off everything. Well, where's that gotten us? A place where we have colostomies, 130,000 colostomies and Crohn's going rampant and C. diff killing 23,000 people a year and chronic immune depression and chronic inflammation. That's not a good place to be. 
turn this car wreck around and let's go back and let's figure out what's going on here and embrace good bacteria and feed them well to have a strong microbiome. And that includes fertility and immune system function, inflammation, all walks of life come through that process of having a strong microbiome, which is fed by these things we're talking about, raw milk and living whole foods, not highly processed foods. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that came to mind when you were talking about the difference between the requirements of bacteria when it's sent for pasteurization. So it's a really important point. I think that there's a there's a quote and I I don't I think it might have came from you. I feel like it might have been a quote from you that said something like pasteurization excuses filth. It sounds like something you would say. But it's it's interesting because if you think about this and again this is I always say like I know way too much about milk. How much do you want to <laughs> how much do you want to get into? But uh, if you think about it if you are a raw milk farmer and you have a a cow with mastitis, so an infection of the udder, and it's like pussing and all kinds of problems. Like you're not milking that cow. You're going to treat the mastitis. And then you're only going to use cows that are in, you know, optimal pristine health uh, to milk. But if you are a mass producer for just regular commercial dairy, it actually doesn't matter if the cow has mastitis or is sick because you can still milk the cow and put it in. And I remember reading that some of these giant dairy producers they combine milk from thousands of cows. And so then because it's going to be boiled and pasteurized in the end, then it, it really doesn't matter if it has all of that. So if you think about then why is it that regular milk makes people sick? I mean, we, there's a lot of different or like causes allergies and, you know, just the different issues with it. Uh, I'm sure that, to, you know, there's all of these different points. But if you think about that, if there could be like pus and all kinds of stuff that's then boiled, but it's still there, that doesn't sound right. You know, it doesn't sound right. Whereas with raw milk, it's a different situation altogether because the milk is so clean, it doesn't have to be boiled. And that's kind of one of the things I was hoping to, to kind of demythify, if you will, in this conversation between the two of us today is that there is a, an actual difference between the two, just so that you're aware and the process as consumers demand kind of healthier options just in general, this process of uh, raw milk production is becoming more and more standardized. And I would love to uh, just hear your take on the fact that it's not illegal everywhere. There are places, primarily I think Europe, where it's fully legal and you can even get raw milk from vending machines. Right, that's correct. Uh, raw milk's legal across the United States in many different states, California, Washington, Arizona, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, uh, Maine, Connecticut. You can all buy raw milk in the store. And then there's uh, many, many states where you buy raw milk on the farm, Texas and other places you can buy raw milk on the farm. And then there's states where you have to buy a part of a cow share like in Colorado. But raw milk is universally available across the United States, except for a couple of states, Hawaii and I think Montana, where raw milk's illegal in any form, but people still get it anyway. In Canada, raw milk is illegal, but there's raw milk all over the place. So it's kind of one of those things where if you want raw milk, you can find it. But if it's legal and there's good standards applied, then the idea that, that you will have a better understanding of what that milk is, unless you have to do your own research to know what your raw milk is. And that's where you go to rawmilkinstitute.org and actually find out what the common standards are and ask the hard questions to your farmer to assure that he's at least coming up to some of those standards or she is coming up to those standards to assure that the milk is, is relatively safe. But yeah, in Europe, France, Italy, there are vending machines on the street to allow farmers to sell directly to consumers and they've had a couple of challenges here and there with it because it's kind of hard to uh, maintain that vending machine to assure that the milk is chilled, uh, it kept cold, and how you uh, uh, fill the bottle and not fill the bottle. There's all kinds of issues, but they figured out most of it. But it's kind of a, it's an example of the fact that when you have that kind of transparency and that kind of availability, that kind of normalcy, normalcy, that raw milk can be universally available and people are not dropping like flies. They're thriving and they're enjoying it and they're loving it. And it's a local food. So we really have to resolve in our minds that this whole suppression of raw milk is a political act to suppress the market because when raw milk goes directly from a farmer to a consumer, the processors lose. Processors hate that. They'll do everything in their power, including yet the forces of the United States government, the CDC and the NIH do all their bidding for them to suppress it any way they can. It's really sad. But if you go to the social platforms, 
and you talk to moms about their their experience with raw milk, you'll get nothing but a glory story. My God, it's it's the fan, most fantastic thing that ever happened because when you give a baby raw milk, breastfeeding first and then after that raw milk, they sleep well. They sleep really well. They never get sick. They poop well. They behave great. They have strong teeth. They rarely go to the doctor if they ever do. It's just an enjoyment to have a child that's not screaming their head off with gas cramps in their gut. The kid is thriving and not gets getting sick and, ha- and having a strong immune system and pooping great. So what a fantastic thing for a family to have is healthy family. Mom and dad don't ever get sick either, or they rarely do, and they have a strong immune system. So it's a wonderful family food to promote health of the family. And again, don't believe everything you see coming from the government. You have to do your own research and look at the peer-reviewed uh, actual literature itself, and it's all over the place. And talk to people who've had a real experience with raw milk versus those that are politically, uh, their paycheck depends on suppressing it somehow by telling a story from the 1800s. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll make sure to all link to your website and a few different places for more information. One of the things that I know Sally Fallon Morell always says is that, you know, even if you don't have access to actual raw milk, raw dairy, you in most places in the world, if not all places in the world, you can usually find raw cheese. Kefir is is becoming a lot more prevalent and, and accessible. And uh, even with raw dairy, you know, I made kefir for years, I would um, I let my, I think I let my grains die. <laughs> I should have, uh-huh. I should have taken better care of my poor grains. Yeah. I'm planning to start it again at some point, but with the raw dairy, when you ferment it for anyone who has any concerns about pathogens or things like that, there's a lot of ways to consume, I guess you could say, there's a lot of things that you can do with it. And when you talk about the microbiome, the research on kefir is fascinating, showing that, you know, there's so much more variety of bacterial species when the milk is then fermented with kefir grains. So for anyone who is kind of thinking, making that switch to less processed, more real food, kind of really understanding where their food is coming from, and even participating in this process, when you said, you know, talking to your doc, uh, talking to your farmer, finding out where your food goes, finding out what's available locally. I think just the experience of connecting with farmers and actually buying not necessarily everything local, but really kind of making that effort to find out who is producing food around you can really connect you to your community in, in different ways as well. Yep. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being here. This was such an informative conversation that we had today. Can you share just a little bit about where the listeners can go to find you, your website, contact information, all the good stuff? Let me give you three uh, email, three uh, contact pieces. Mark at OrganicPastures.com, M-A-R-K at OrganicPastures.com. I love emails from anybody. I do a lot of educational outreach. OrganicPastures.com. OrganicPastures.com will give you an interesting place to look at a commercial website where you actually see all the information about raw milk. And then rawmilkinstitute.org is an archive of all of the medical studies, all the research and everything else. And our PhD researchers that work with us, the veterinarians that work with us, all contribute to have that really wonderful archive library of resources for people who don't have to look all over the place for it. It's right there, rawmilkinstitute.org. If you want to have fun, you go to Farmers Over Pharmacies, farmersoverpharmacies.com, and you actually look at video case studies of people that have recovered from severe illness using raw milk, Crohn's disease, allergies, asthma, uh, digestive issues. All of these case studies are there. We're not putting words in people's mouths. They're just video interviews of people just telling their story about how they recovered from near-death experience because their gut microbiome was so sick. So farmersoverpharmacies.com, rawmilkinstitute.org, organicpastures.com, and mark at organicpastures.org. Uh, And I'd be more than happy to reach anyone and talk to anyone about this. Well, thank you so much, Mark. This has been a fantastic conversation and I'm excited to share it. Thank you, Lisa. Go get them. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 347. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Mark. Certainly eye-opening to discover how big of an industry this is. I'm sure some of you don't necessarily deep dive into the topic of milk on a regular basis. And for those of you who are quite familiar, maybe then just nice to hear from, you know, the man himself who has been instrumental in really creating and standardizing the the standards and protocols for uh, raw dairy farmers across the U.S. and also the world. 
I think that this is an important conversation to be had because I think that it's helpful not to have a black and white milk is good or milk is bad because there can be a lot of different factors. And many women are negatively affected by the regular A1 pasteurized, highly, highly, highly processed dairy products that we find in our local supermarkets. Having the high inflammatory markers, having the problematic A1 protein, um, having the denatured pro uh, proteins in the milk and on all the different issues that can really contribute to inflammation and period pain. Knowing that switching to different alternatives, whether you, you know, try goats or sheep milk, or whether you look for, you know, an A2 producer, or whether you look to see if unpasteurized milk is available in your, uh, where you live, and, and to really learn about the, the standardization protocols and all the different things that these farmers must do to ensure the safety of their products. I think that if nothing more, it is a, certainly an interesting and important topic to be aware of. Uh, and once, uh, for me, I know that I was keenly interested in this topic when I had my first child because uh, certainly we were looking for the healthiest possible options uh, for him. And we had tried goats and sheep dairy that was pasteurized and different things. And um, eventually we found a different source for unpasteurized milk. And we saw some differences and changes in terms of his, you know, reactions, runny noses improved, things like that. So, so yeah, it's a very interesting topic. And I'm glad to have had the opportunity to have Mark on the show to give us that deep dive. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you are tuning into the show. And of course, until next time, be well and happy charting.